All right, welcome back. Today is the final part of our review of BCBA exam number two. And we're going to go through the last 10 questions together and break down the questions as we would break them down on the real exam. So if you're new to the channel, welcome. If you're returning, welcome back. Please like and subscribe. If you're looking for our proven study materials, please check out bcbastudy.com. We offer three full practice exams, a fifth edition task list study guide, combo pack, which comes with everything. And we also offer tutoring. Other questions, comments, let me know. I'd love to help. Keep working hard, keep studying hard, and let's get to our questions. 151, Pauline has five sons and seven grandsons. They all share similar features, including dark hair, dark eyes, and small noses. These traits are considered what? Now, remember, operant behavior and behavior analysis, right? We're really looking at typically learning history, behavior history, that kind of thing. However, do we need to take into consideration family history, medical history, genetic history? Sure, right? It's all part of the bigger picture. So it's important that we know the difference between phylogenic and ontogenic. Now, these traits are obviously not respondent and they're not elicited, right? They're either going to be phylogenic or ontogenic. Phylogenic is simple, simply biological nature, right? Evolution genetics, things like dark hair, dark eyes, and small noses. So these type of traits that are passed down from generation to generation, biologically, genetically, that's considered phylogenic. Ontogenic would be learning history. So antecedents, consequences. If we were talking about how the sons behaved based on their learning history, we would be talking about ontogenic, but we're not. We're talking about these genetic traits, dark hair, dark eyes, small noses. We're talking about phylogenic traits. 152. Okay, so we updated 152. We sent out the updated exam, so hopefully you got it. 152, use the graph below. Assuming series one is your baseline and series two, three, and four are your interventions, how could you determine the most effective intervention based on the data you currently have? Now, let's not overthink this particular question. So we have our title, frequency of aggression per session. Let's look at series one, our baseline. If you look at session one, aggression happened eight times, session two, seven, session three, eight, right? Then we have series two, three, and four, which are our interventions. And all three interventions were effective in their own way. Series two wasn't quite as effective as series three and four. And series three is a little more effective than series four, right? And we can see that based on our data. Series three, we had one instance of aggression for three days. Series four, we had one instance of aggression for only one day. So at, even though they overlap, series three is still just a little bit better. So if we want to find the most effective intervention, what we really need to do is visually analyze this chart and which one are we going to pick? Are we going to A, continue taking data until series three or four separates itself from the others? Well, no need really. They've already separated themselves, right? We've reduced it and it's clearly separate from series two. So now we're just gonna visually analyze our data, right? And let's just look and see that series three is just gonna be more effective. B, use a multiple baseline design to evaluate each treatment individually. We've already evaluated each treatment. We have data for each treatment. C, withdraw treatment and then implement each intervention separately. No need, again, we have four data points. There's no need to withdraw three and four to implement a worse series two intervention. So D, series three is the most effective treatment, right? Simplest explanation is usually the best. In this case, series three, right? The least amount of frequency of aggression after baseline, just use series three. 153, use the table below. Based on visual analysis, when should you schedule your observation periods? Okay, we have a scatter plot here. Visual analysis is what we use to examine and analyze graphed data in ABA. So we're going to use our visual analysis skills to look at the scatter plot and decide when we should observe during these different periods. So let's look at our chart. X is an occurrence, zero is no occurrence. If we look at 8 a.m., we have one occurrence throughout the week. 9 a.m., we have one occurrence throughout the week. We get to 10 a.m., it jumps to three occurrences. 11 a.m., three occurrences. 12 p.m., four occurrences, 1 p.m. back down to one, 2 p.m. back down to one. 
So if we want to schedule our observation to see the behavior occurring, when should you schedule it? Well, when the behavior is happening the most. So A, between 8 a.m. and 9 a.m. Well, 8 a.m. has one occurrence, 9 a.m. has one occurrence, right? Is that more than 10, 11, and 12? No, right? 10, 11, and 12 are going to be better. So what about 10, 11 a.m.? Well, 10 and 11 a.m. are better than 8 and 9 a.m., right? 3, 3 and 3. But if we look at 12, we have 4. So why not include 12? C, between 10 a.m. and 12 p.m., we're going to observe during the height of this occurrence, right? 10 a.m., 3, 11 a.m., 3, 12 p.m., 4, to try to get the best data and try to catch the behavior as it's happening. And of course, 1 and 2 p.m. have the same issue 8 and 9 do. They're just not happening as frequently as 10, 11, and 12. If we were going to visually analyze this to determine an observation period, we would obviously choose between 10 a.m. and 12 p.m. 154, Martha conducts preference assessments to determine what her students are interested in at the moment. Based on that assessment, she designs tokens and picks out backup stimuli to use in her token economy. What does Martha need to do in order to make sure this economy is effective? All right, token economies. We, we, we want to determine what Martha needs to do to make her economy effective. So Martha's done preference assessments to understand what they're interested in. Using that assessment, she designed tokens and picked out backup stimuli. What's next? She's only done a preference assessment, so she only knows what they like. Does that mean it's going to be reinforcing? Absolutely not. And tokens are only as powerful as their backup reinforcers. So in order to make sure Martha's economy is effective, we're going to need to start identifying some reinforcement. So A, include a response cost as well. Do we have to include a response cost in a token economy? Absolutely not. Can you? Sure. It's, it's a traditional part of a token economy, commonly used, but you don't have to include one to make sure your economy is effective. B, include a punishment procedure. No, certainly not, right? Tokens are inherently positive reinforcement, right? We're, we're giving tokens as reinforcement. No need to Im include a punishment procedure just because, right? So additionally, a response cost is a punishment procedure, and we just said that's not necessary. So A and B are, are wrong. C, identify what backup stimuli are reinforcing. Yes, we've done the preference assessments. We've picked out tokens, backup stimuli, blah, blah, blah. Doesn't matter unless we determine, hey, are these going to change behavior? Are they reinforcing or not? That's what Martha needs to do next to really make sure her economy is effective. And then D, pair the tokens with praise. That's absolutely what you should be doing, right? We want to pair tokens with praise to establish praise as a GCR. But more importantly than that, we need to follow up this preference assessment take these backup stimuli and identify what are and aren't reinforcing. 155, there are doubts surrounding one of your technician's ability to take data accurately, reliably, and validly. In order to best assess the data collection, a behavior, an behavior analyst should do what? So if you have doubts about your technician's ability to take data, what do you need to do as a behavior analyst? Remember your responsibility as a behavior analyst to the client and to your technicians. You are responsible for the case. What do you need to do as an analyst? Do you need to A, take data on the same target at the same time as the technician? Yes. What better way to figure out if that technician is not taking valid data, if they're not taking accurate data, if they're not taking reliable data, than to take data with them? You're gonna quickly find out, is their data good or is their data bad? A is pretty good, right? Let's read all of our answer choices and see if we have a better answer. B, assign a second technician, technician to take data on the target behavior. You could do that. That's one way to take this IOA data. But wouldn't it be better for you to take the data yourself? Yes. A is just stronger than B. C, video record the technician taking data. Okay, but you're not taking data, right? So we really need to want, we really want to compare our data to their data. And then D, visually analyze the collected data after the session. Again, fine. B, C, and D are fine. A is just going to be best. You're going to sit in the same room as a technician, and you're both going to record data on the same behavior and then compare in the moment. A is by far the strongest. It is our best answer as to what a behavior analyst should do in order to best assess this technician's ability to take data. 
156, the parents and the teachers of a client are convinced that the client engages in constant escape maintained behavior when presented with difficult tasks. In response, you take data for three weeks using escape behavior as your target. At the completion of data collection, collection the data does not indicate escape behavior is an issue. What should you do? All right, kind of a tricky scenario you have. You have parents and teachers telling you, hey, this client engages in constant escape maintained behavior. So you say, okay, I'm going to take data and we'll see. At the completion, the data does not indicate escape behavior is an issue. Well, the data is the data, right? It's empirical. You observe it. What do you do next? A, proceed with the behavior change intervention anyway. Well, no, your data just told you it's not escape maintained. What are you going to be targeting since it's not escape maintained? You don't just proceed against what the data tells you. B, inform both the teacher and parent they're wrong and use the data as your proof. Now, we're not going to just walk up to them and say, hey, you're wrong. Here's proof, okay? It's a better way to do that. How about we see conduct another indirect assessment interview with the parent and the teacher and present your data to them? This way, we remain collaborative. We remain in good standing. We develop that rapport. Conducting an indirect assessment, get together, interview them, say, hey, here's our data. I know what you said, but this is what we saw. Let's try to revisit it. Let's try to find something different. C is just better than B. And then D, continue taking data until the hypothesis is proved true. Maybe it's not escape maintained. You could take data until you're blue in the face. Your hypothesis might never be true. That's just the way it works, right? In this case, if your data is telling you one thing and goes against what the parents and teachers tell you, you need to get with them, do an indirect assessment, and present your data to them. 157, quick, easy question. A type one error is also known as a false positive. What is a false negative? That is a type two error. You just got to know this, okay? Really no tricks to it. Type one is false positive. Type two is false negative. 158, which of the following measurement procedures would be least appropriate to record instances of self-injury that look like a rapid strike to one's own face? When we are picking a measurement procedure, we pick measurement based on behavior. We don't go in with the predetermined measurement system. If we have a rapid strike to one's own face, meaning hand contacts face rapidly and stops, what's going to be the worst way to record that? What about rate? Well, rate, you could take a frequency on this rapid strike and then put it over time. Rate would be just fine. What about frequency? Could you count how many rapid strikes to one's face? Sure, no issues. What about inter-response time? Could you calculate how long in between rapid strikes passes? Yes, from rapid strike A to B, B to C, C to D, so on. You could definitely take IRT. Why would duration be bad? Well, duration is going to be bad because a rapid strike implies maybe less than two seconds. So what's the point of duration here? A rapid strike, all it takes is a second. You can only reduce duration so much. Duration is going to be really the most inappropriate way to record a rapid strike to one's own face because you can't really change the duration, okay? Unless the strike occurs for a long period of time for some reason, right? But if it's rapid, it's a rapid strike, that seems to imply that it's going to be quick. Duration seems a little inappropriate compared to A, B, and D. 159, a behavior technician is implementing a skill acquisition plan targeting two-step instructions. The behavior technician will deliver an SD such as pick up that pencil and give me a high five. The client receives reinforcement for accurate responding. What type of training is this? All right, the client is receiving reinforcement for accurate responding. How is the client responding? What must they do? Well, the client must respond to pick up that pencil, then give me a high five. Two-step instructions, they have to listen, right? So we have speaker behavior, and then we have listener behavior. In this case, what are we training for? We're clearly training for listener behavior, right? Pick up that pencil, give me a high five, sit in your seat. We're not looking in autoclitics, right? We're not looking at the verbal operand here. We're looking at listener behavior. Expressive behavior, okay, is spoken. This client is simply listening to what the behavior technician is saying. And there is no intraverbal because the client is not responding verbally. They are just responding accurately to picking up the pencil and giving a high five. 
We are clearly engaging in listener training. And then finally, 160, the hero procedure refers to what intervention? Obviously a group contingency. So the hero procedure means what? It means we are reliant on a single person for the whole group. So if there's a hundred people, we are reliant on a single person for that whole group to receive reinforcement. Many ethical dilemmas at play here, but we're not worried about that. We're just worried about what hero procedure or what group contingency is the hero procedure. Would it be the dependent group contingency? Yes, right? We're dependent on the hero. We're dependent on one person or a set of people. Interdependent means we're dependent on the whole group. Everybody in the group must do it. Independent, you're only responsible for yourself. And then naturalistic, right? We are naturalistically implementing a contingency, not a hero procedure, which is contrived. The hero procedure refers to the dependent group contingency. Okay, thank you for watching. That wraps up exam two. We will start exam three uh, next week. So be on the lookout for that. As always, 